Okay, um, good morning. We might start this morning's uh, Melbourne Law School Tax Clinic first public information session. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. And I'd also like to note, um, as you can see, this morning's presentation is being recorded and the Q&A session after will also be recorded. So if you don't want to be on camera, please do let one of our staff know. Um, my name is Associate Professor Sunita Joygarajan and together with Julian Panetta and Kate fisher Doherty, I'm one of the organisers of the Melbourne Law School Tax Clinic, which we're setting up this year. And the tax clinic is being set up under a government-funded national tax clinic trial and we will be providing assistance to uh, unrepresented taxpayers to assist them in their tax matters. So. The law school students will be the people providing the advice, but of course they will do this under supervision and they'll be supervised by our full-time clinic supervisor as well as a number of volunteer tax professionals. So the tax clinic will be running in the second half of the year from August to October and we'll be seeing individual clients and assisting individual clients at that time. So if you are interested in uh, the tax clinic and think you'd make like to visit the tax clinic in the second half of the year, please do sign up for uh, to receive further information about the clinic. As you may be aware, when you signed up, this morning's information session is on the taxpayer rights and obligations and also the support available to you from the Australian Tax Office. We have two further sessions organised as well um, on the gig economy and also on investment income and expenses. So this morning we're fortunate to have two senior tax professionals volunteer to present on this topic. Our first presenter is Sean Cartoon from HWL Ebsworth Lawyers. Sean has extensive experience in corporate, international and employment taxes and he's also been involved in many tax audits and disputes and he's litigated significant tax cases in the Australian courts. Our second presenter this morning is Cameron Garrett. He is the Executive Director of the Review and Dispute Resolution Area of the Australian Tax Office and Cameron is currently responsible for disputes in relation to individuals and he leads the Dispute Assist Project which he will be talking about today. So please join me in welcoming our two presenters. I think we'll start with Sean and then uh, Cameron will speak. Thanks very much, Sunita. A lively, if albeit slightly cynical audience, perhaps this morning I see already. That's great. If you have any difficult questions, throw them my way. If you have any very difficult ones, please save them for Cameron in the second half of the presentation. All right. So this. Today, this is just a bit of a, a warm-up to what will be the main show, which is the MLS Tax Clinic in August and September. So, um, we'll be covering a few areas today, and thank you very much for um, uh, making time on your Saturday morning to come out and, and listen to us. Um, we hope that we, we, we give you some new information that you find helpful. Um, so, what we're going to be covering today um, a, a couple of slides on just the basics of tax to get us all warmed up. Um, who needs to lodge a tax return and how to do so? What to do if you disagree with the ATO? How you can respond if liable for penalties and interest? And various support programs and initiatives offered to taxpayers. And I think the the um, the overriding message and and theme of of today's session is that if you are worried about something and you do think that you're in a bit of a pickle, then then the the, the message is to not just um, sit on your backside and do nothing, but to get out there and actually um, go and discuss it with the ATO. And I know some of you might be cynical about that, and and um, that might be from past experiences. But, as Cameron will, will mention, the ATO has a number of um, fairly new initiatives that are, that are aimed at um, assisting taxpayers 
And um, th the overriding message is if you think you're in a, in a pickle, you're going to be much better off if you proactively go out there and discuss it with the tax office. Uh, and you will get much better treatment if you have done that rather than if you're just sitting there waiting for the tax office to potentially um, audit you and, and come after you in, a, in an audit context. So I think that's, that's the message. And, and with the MLS tax clinic, that's one of the activities that we'll be, we'll be doing with, with taxpayers that come forward for that clinic. So if you need assistance, you've been receiving n nasty letters from the tax office, you don't know quite what they mean, then um, you can bring those letters to us at the clinic and um, we'll help you understand what they mean and we'll set out a plan for you to take steps to ultimately work your way through them methodically to get yourself um, out of the situation that you're in. So <coughs> the basics, some of the basics of tax. So the ATO collects income tax each financial year. We all know that. So that's 1 July to 30 June. The magic formula in tax. Taxable income equals assessable income minus allowable deductions. So you're not going to have a tax problem unless you've at least made some money from doing something. Unless you're just lodging tax returns for no reason, which we assume th that wouldn't be the ordinary case. But you have to be doing something and making some form of assessable income to potentially have a tax problem. That's the one side of the equation. And then against your assessable income, you're allowed to reduce that by, an, uh, by generally the costs that you're incurring in generating that assessable income. And they are referred to as your allowable deductions. And then once you apply the magic formula and you come up with your taxable income for an income year, um, if you're an, an Australian resident individual, then you pay tax at your marginal rate on a, on a, on a sliding threshold. And the first 18,200 of taxable income, you, you wouldn't pay any tax on that. And then as you progress, um, the, more, the more taxable income you have in an income year, the more tax you'll pay progressively. And then if you're, if you're lucky enough to be earning more than $180,000 a year, then you'll be paying 40, 5% tax on every dollar over 180,000 plus the 2% Medicare levy on top of that. Um, so assessable income consists of ordinary income and, and statutory income. Um, ordinary income, just some of the basic examples there, salary and wages, interest, business sales, um, not lottery prizes or not loans and gifts. If you have a family member that's gifting you an amount um, for whatever reason, that, that's not an amount of assessable income and nor would it be um, an allowable deduction to the, to the family member that's paying the gift. And then the best example of statutory income is capital gains tax, um, which was introduced back in uh, 1985. And um, there's, that's a specific regime that, that's, that brings to tax um, amounts, amounts of capital um, if a relevant event happens. So a classic example is if you own a, an, um, um, a, a piece of land and that piece of land, you've had it for a very long time and that's a capital asset of yours, then when you sell that land um, and you make a profit on that, you'll have to account for that. Um, under our capital gains tax rules. Um, so deductions, um, I suspect th this, is, this is a very vast area, um, deductions, and I suspect it's an area that, that brings um, um, taxpayers into, into conflict with the ATO fairly regularly at the individual level um, because there's a bit of science around claiming deductions and, and I reckon um, a number of people probably um, don't always um, consider fully the, the, the relevant tests when they're including amounts in their taxable in their um, in their tax returns and claiming deductions. But here are the tests: um, you can claim a, a deduction for a loss or outgoing um, to the extent that it's incurred in gaining um, or producing assessable income, or necessarily incurred in carrying on a business. Um, however, you can't 
claim the amount. If it's a loss or outgoing of a capital nature, or it's a private or domestic expense, or it's incurred in gaining exempt income, or it's specifically excluded by a statutory provision. Um, this is another hallmark of our tax system, which is that it's a self-assessment system. You don't go to the tax office and sit there with your books and get the tax office to account for your income and deductions and then agree on an amount and then pay it. That, that's, that's perhaps the old way of doing it. But we have a self-assessment system where everyone is um, individually responsible for their own personal tax affairs. And if you're operating your business through a company um, or a trust or a partnership, then, you're, then you'll be responsible for your entity's tax affairs and your entity lodging its tax return um, to account for income. And what, what underpins this self-assessment system is, uh, is, is the principle of, of honesty. The tax office can't possibly check every single tax return that is lodged. As technology's improving and the ATO's ability to use various data matching um, and, and cross-checking sources increases, I think the, the ATO's level of sophistication with checking tax returns um, is, is definitely, has definitely improved and will continue to improve. But fundamentally, it's up to you to be honest when you lodge your tax return and declare what your taxable income is for the tax year. And the ATO assumes the starting point is that everyone has been honest and everyone is being honest in their dealings with the tax office. And the other, the, the flip side of, of the, the equation is that the ATO is armed by the tax legislation with some fairly powerful um, tools in the form of a penalty and interest regime that can be brought to bear on a taxpayer that has not um, complied with that principle to be honest in their dealings and to and to um, properly and correctly uh, lodge their tax return. And we'll be discussing um, penalties and interest a bit later. Um, and generally there's a period of review. So you lodge your tax return, you're issued an assessment by the tax office, and then there's a period of review in which the ATO can, um, if it chooses to, send you a letter and advise you that it would like to ask you a few questions about that about your tax return that you lodged. And um, that period of review doesn't last forever. You're not forever exposed to, um, uh, to what you may have put in your tax return. For most um, in individuals in small business, the period of review is two years, but that can be four years for individuals with more complex uh, tax affairs and, and larger businesses. So what tax registrations do I need? The critical one, if, if you're an individual, is um, a tax file number. You don't have to have a tax file number, but if you don't, then whenever you go and work somewhere and, and someone pays you an amount of, of, of um, salary and wages, they'll be required to withhold tax at the, at the highest marginal rate. So it's really not in your self-interest to not get a tax file number and register because um, if your employer will say, well, if you don't, you don't give me your TFN, fine, you don't have to, you don't even have to have one, but I have to withhold at 47% um, from, from any payments that I make to you. Um, and the way that then works is that you as the individual will get a credit in your, in, in your tax um, um, return for the amount that has been withheld by your employer. And you'll, you, you should be able to get um, a refund of the difference if you, if, if you pass certain tests and, and do actually um, register and get a, ta a tax file number. Um, the other common form of tax, tax um, registration is, is an ABN if you're carrying on a business. There are rules that require um, businesses that are engaging other businesses or, or, or making payments to businesses to withhold tax also at the highest marginal rate if a business does not provide an ABN. So it's common if you're, if you're actually running a small business 
um, one of the tax registrations that that you'll you'll need in practice is to register for an, an ABN. Um, who needs to lodge a tax return? So, <coughs> if any of the following applies, and we're we're, we're assuming only um, Australian tax residents here, so the the situation is more complicated if you're a if you're a foreign tax resident or a temporary resident, but if you're an Australian tax resident. Um, you need to lodge a tax return if your taxable income exceeds the tax-free threshold for the year, so 18200 If If um, tax was deducted from any payments such as wages, so if you're in the POYG withholding system, or if you wish to claim any tax deductions. You can't claim any tax deductions unless you lodge a tax return and, in, and include in that the specific amounts um, and the basis for claiming those amounts as tax deductions. So how do you lodge it? You can lodge it <clears throat> online, paper form, or through a registered tax agent. Um, lodgement period. So um, the income year ends on 30 June, and if you're an individual with simple tax affairs and you don't have a tax agent, then you're required to lodge your tax return by um, 31 October. So that means that for the income year ending 30 June 2019, you'll be required to lodge your tax return by 31 October to 2019. So what if you do not lodge? Um, well, if you did not lodge, well, lodge now. Don't don't delay. Just get out there and, and lodge it. And um, uh, attach a, a cover letter if you can when you lodge your tax return and, and, and give reasons for why it is late. Um, failure to lodge penalties can apply. Yes, yes, that is that is the case. You can ask for remission of the penalties if there's a, a good reason. And I think that's that's another hallmark of the tax system with penalties and with interests. If you are genuine in your attempt to approach the tax office and resolve um, an issue that you have with them, then you can generally expect fairly good treatment when it comes to remitting penalties and, and interest on the amounts that um, you've been on your tax shortfall. So, <clears throat> your tax return, what does it need to cover? Well, very basically, it needs to cover the things we've been, uh, we've been talking about today, mainly income and, and deductions. Um, if you're an Australian resident taxpayer, then you are taxed on your worldwide income. So that, that's another key principle of our tax system. If you're Australian resident, doesn't matter if, you've, if you're earning some kind of income in, in, in China, Hong Kong, um, London, all of your income needs to be included in your Australian tax return. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll pay double tax on that income because we have a system of, of credits in our tax system that that um, gives you a credit for amounts of foreign tax that you've had to pay as well. So so just because you're including your worldwide income in your Australian tax return doesn't mean you'll necessarily pay double tax. Um, you need to declare your entitlement to the tax-free threshold and any deductions or losses. So then what is an, an assessment? So an assessment is the critical piece of paper <clears throat> that the tax office will issue to you after you've lodged a tax return that will state on it the amount your your tax liability for an income year and this piece of paper this assessment is is critical to your rights as a taxpayer because once you're issued an assessment it gives you certain rights under our tax law to um, to deal with that assessment if you consider it to be excessive. So an assessment might be issued to you based on your own tax return, in which case you probably aren't going to think it's excessive because you prepared your own tax return. But there are circumstances where the ATO has power to issue default assessments if you're a taxpayer and you just haven't lodged any tax returns and the ATO has reason to believe that you have um, tax taxable income in certain years, the ATO can just issue you assessments. Um, or the ATO after after an audit, they can amend your your assessment and impose a higher tax liability on you. So 
An assessment is a very important document because with an assessment, you as a taxpayer have, have certain rights. You have a number of rights, principally the right to object against that assessment if you think it is excessive and the tax law gives you that right. Um, and generally, in, in the, in a, if, you're an, if you're an individual or small business, you'll have two years to object. Um, <clears throat> and so this is an example also in, in, an, in, an, um, in the Melbourne Law School tax clinic context. This is an example where if you've received an assessment from the tax office and you're not sure why or you don't think it's correct for some reason, you think the ATO's got it wrong, this is an example where you can bring that assessment in to us at the tax clinic in, in August and September and we can help you um, um, tell you what it means and what your rights are and, and how we think you should best deal with that assessment. Um, if you disagree, you can organise in-house facilitation and Cameron will shortly speak about that. You can lodge an, ob an objection <clears throat> and then ultimately, um, if your objection is disallowed by the tax office because, for example, you haven't managed to prove to the tax office that the assessment uh, is excessive, then ultimately you have a further right if the assessment, if your objection is disallowed, you have a further right to then appeal the, the disallowance of the objection to either the, the tribunal or to the federal court. Um, but Hopefully none of you ever are in that position and ho hopefully um, you can work things out with the tax office as part of the, um, the, object the, the assessment and objection process. So in-house facilitation, I might throw to Cameron quickly to, to just tell us about what in-house facilitation is and the points in time at which it, it can become relevant to you as a taxpayer. Um, hi everyone, yeah, I am um, one of the directors in the tax office that deals with the disputes um, area, so um, quite recently, um, probably even about the last four or so years ago, we actually separately, uh, we separated the processes of the audit and the objections function, um, so that there's a totally independent area in the office now that deals with the objections. Um, and, and we'll talk about the objections in sort of more detail um, sort of shortly. So, so it's almost like you lodge your tax return. Um, you may then um, um, have an amended assessment as a result of a review by the, by the office or an audit by the office, or you may want to choose to, to amend your return, and that, that is a separate area of the office that can then deal with those um, um, disputes, if you like. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the um, additional services that we've added to the um, to that disputes function um, shortly. One of which is the in-house facilitation service. Uh, we thought we'd talk about this one early because this can happen at any stage, um, whereas a number of the f services I'll talk about um, in a moment will be um, once you get into a dispute, once you're in that sort of objections phase. So, um, for about probably six years now, we've had this service called in-house facilitation, and it is basically um, the, um, uh, the the national accredited mediation service. So, so we have over a hundred offices in the tax office um, that have now gone through the national mediation accredited service and can actually run um, what is akin to a mediation for um, taxpayers. Um, where one party is the, the tax group that you've been dealing with, that's been dealing with your issue, um, and, and you're the second party, and there's an independent person from the tax office that's trained in mediation that obviously understands all the systems of, of the tax office and how the, the, the tax office works, um, and runs through this, this mediation uh, process, which, um, which, which, which brings the parties together to, to talk about the dispute, um, and often the discussion about the dispute is quite often a different discussion about the actual issue, the tax issue. Um, it brings into play more, more relevant factors for the taxpayer, such as their personal circumstances, their ability to pay, how they got into this position in the first place and those sorts of things. And then the parties can decide how best to try and resolve that 
through the um, through the facilitator guiding them through that that service. Um, importantly, the the mediator doesn't decide the case, so it's not like um, conciliation, arbitration, these sorts of matters. This is where the mediator is purely there to guide parties through a process, a national accredited process of me of a mediation to to get the parties together to um, to dis to explore options to to think about um, how best the dispute might be able to be resolved and quite often those disputes can get resolved on the day of the of the mediation. The important thing is though that the parties still control the, the process. So so whatever the tax team who's dealing with your matter is and, and the taxpayer are, the, are in charge of whatever decisions they want to make. The mediator takes them through the process to guide them to where they, they um, need to get to, generating options and thinking about alternative things, getting, getting behind the dispute and seeing if there's something in that that can actually help resolve it. Um, and the good thing is it's a free service and if the mediation doesn't resolve the dispute, um, all of your rights, so no matter what stage of the process you do this, it's almost like a timeout. If it doesn't resolve, you just continue along the process. So you, you, can, you might then be in the objection stage or you might be at the appeal stage or, or whatever the case might be. So. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. So <clears throat> objecting against an assessment. So... If you believe an, an assessment is excessive, um, and that might be because you think it was issued based on an erroneous understanding of the facts or the law, um, then as a taxpayer, you can lodge an objection against, against that assessment. And um, if you've come through an audit and at the end of an audit, the ATO might issue its its um, statement of audit position to you and tell you that it's it's going to be amending your assessment to increase your tax liability. It might be that at that point, you haven't managed to convince the ATO of um, of the the of of your of your the reasons why you think the ATO is incorrect, and quite commonly in my experience, that's because it, it all comes down to the facts and it's probably because you haven't convinced the ATO because you haven't provided the ATO with the necessary facts to convince them. So it might be that the ATO issues an amended assessment to you after an audit, but that's because you perhaps weren't very forthright in the audit process in actually telling the ATO what all the facts were. And so the ATO can issue you an amended assessment if based on the fact that it has at a point in time, it considers that, you, that your tax liability should be higher. And the onus is on, is on you as the taxpayer to prove that the assessment is excessive. And that usually takes quite a bit of work once a taxpayer has got themselves in a position where the ATO has formed an embedded view on how a tax provision operates to their facts. Um, so it might be that you turn around and say, well, I think the assessment is excessive because either the, the ATO misunderstood the facts, I, I, may not have, I may not have done the work necessary to put forward all of the relevant facts, or you might believe that the ATO misunderstood the law. And, and that is also quite common in tax because tax laws are inherently very grey and reasonable minds can often take, uh, can often and do take different views on how the tax laws actually apply. So it might be that there's no dispute as to the facts, but the dispute is simply as to how a particular tax law applies to those facts. And that, and that can be a, um, a perfectly valid reason to consider an assessment to be excessive and to object against that, that, that assessment. So um, your notice of objection must be in writing and it must include all the relevant facts and circumstances and all of your arguments and reasons as to why you disagree with the assessment and all of the supporting documentation. So it, this is quite often the point where if you've been, if you've been batting along without any representation, any, any, any legal representation, 
and you've got yourself into this position, this is quite often a point in time where taxpayers um, um, decide to seek external um, legal representation to help them with the objection process and to basically advise on the merits of whether whether they think it's worthwhile for you as a taxpayer to pursue your case and press forward um, to see if you can have the the assessment amended in your favour. So penalties and interest, um, as I was saying before, the ATO has a has a big stick, um, that and and that's in the form of penalties and interest. So if if after an audit in the ATO determines that um, the, the ATO looks at the level of culpability in the behaviour of a taxpayer and then it levies penalties based on what the ATO perceives to be that level of, of culpability. So at a, at a basic level, if you've, if you've just taken a, a lack of reasonable care, you haven't taken reasonable care in your tax affairs, you can expect a 25% penalty. If you've been reckless in your tax affairs, you can expect a 50% penalty. And if you have demonstrated an intentional disregard of the law in your tax affairs, you can expect a 75% penalty. And then the ATO has a few little dials to either further increase the penalties by additional amounts or tone them down a little bit as well. So, so there, there's a very extensive penalty regime and, and that's why it makes sense if you're a taxpayer and you think you've got a problem, it makes sense for you to get on the front foot and go and talk to the ATO about it and be honest and, and forthright in your dealings because then when it comes time for the ATO to consider how this framework applies to you, chances are you'll get much better treatment and you'll receive um, much better level of remissions on these penalties and interests if you took the first step and you've been honest and forthright. Yes, we have a question. You said go and talk to the tax office. I've tried to do that. You can't actually talk to them. They just say there's a telephone over there. Use that. Okay, so the, the, the question from, from the gentleman at the back um, is, is, is an attempt to go and talk to the tax office and a deflection to go and talk to someone else. So I, I, it sounds to me this is, this is a, a, bureauc a bu bureaucracy issue. A, a lack, of, lack of accountability, you're, you're effectively saying, because you can't find someone to help you out. So that's not a question for me, that's for Cameron. So, but, but Cameron's going to be shortly telling you all the different um, functions and, and um, services that the tax office is now providing to taxpayers um, in just that circumstance that, that you mentioned. And um, I guess the message is if, you, if you're a bit cynical about your past dealings with the tax office, give it another go. Um, but I... I, I can imagine that would be very frustrating as a, as a taxpayer to, to not to, to be pushed around in a, in a large bureaucracy. So I guess the only other things to explain are the difference between shortfall interest and general interest. So um, if the ATO amends your assessments for prior years and you have tax shortfalls in prior income years, um, Effectively, what that, that's that's like you having had an interest-free loan from the government. So there's there's a what's called a shortfall interest charge that is imposed to basically um, um, for for the government to re to recover the the time value of money um, that while you've had the money um, because the the assessments weren't issued in those prior income years. Um, the general interest charge is more is more penal in nature. It's a higher rate. And it's it's a daily compounding rate, and it applies to an amount of an actual unpaid tax liability. So when you actually receive um, uh, an assessment with a date by which you have to pay your tax liability, every single day that that tax liability remains unpaid, the general interest charge is accruing on your on your tax liability, compounding daily. So it's a it's a very penal mechanism um, that's 
to encourage taxpayers to pay their tax liability. So what can you do if you're charged with penalties and interest? Well, with penalties, you can separately object against the, the um, notice of, of penalty and you can explain all your reasons as to why um, the level of culpability that the ATO assessed on that scale that I mentioned, why the ATO got it wrong and why the ATO should remit um, the, the penalties in your personal circumstances. And, and again, in, in the context of a tax dispute, this is probably the area where the ATO has the most flexibility. So if the ATO determines as a matter of law that you have a tax shortfall and you have a tax liability in an income year, then the ATO generally does not have any discretion to just say to you, okay, don't worry, you don't have to pay your underlying tax. We, we can talk about certain very narrow circumstances of serious hardship where the ATO might be able to do that. But in, in the general course, the ATO can't just decide if it's determined that you have a tax liability, it can't just write it off. What it, where the ATO does have more discretion is on the penalties and interest. So the ATO does have discretions in the tax law to remit the penalties and interest at its, dis at its complete discretion. And there are a number of practice statements out there on the ATO website um, that tell taxpayers the framework within which the ATO will remit um, penalties based on based on the, the position that you ultimately manage to persuade the ATO that you're in. So um, how the ATO can help you. So now I'll hand over to Cameron to run through the various ATO programs and services to help taxpayers that might find themselves in a position where they've either um, received an assessment that they think is excessive or you haven't lodged a tax return, you don't know what to do, or you're not sure how to lodge a tax return, you're not sure whether a certain amount should be included in as assessable income, you're not sure whether you can claim an amount as a, as a tax deduction. And so now, Cameron will talk to, through, through some of these services um, and, and what that all means. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, uh, we often hear this um, exact complaint about taxpayers getting the runaround and, and not being able to get to the right people. So certainly um, my role here today, if you want to have a chat to me after this session, I'd be more than happy to... to, to um, I've even brought my business cards. People can ring me directly and we'll get you on to the right people that you, know, that you need to get on to. So um, in, in that sort of spirit, uh, we also recognised um, a few years ago that... Um, we are a big um, bureaucratic organisation. We've got about 18 million clients um, and about um, 18,000 staff. And um, the system isn't designed in that way to deal with all the nuances and personal circumstances and these sorts of things that taxpayers might have. Um, so the first thing that we did was set about um, putting together this um, service called um, Dispute Assist. And the Dispute Assist service. The Dispute Assist service was, um, was something that we put together um, to specifically support unrepresented taxpayers, initially in the individual space and now in the small business market, um, who were suffering from or experiencing significant personal circumstances in their lives and, and the existence of those personal circumstances has led them to get into um, issues with not only paying tax and lodging tax returns, but also um, they probably haven't been in a position to be able to concentrate on their own just um, cash flow, running their businesses, paying their bills, all of these sorts of things. And they, and they need some sort of help. So, so when I created this service, we actually had um, up to 100 staff put their hands up to basically pro bono do support work for taxpayers who were in this sort of position. So so they would take the time out to spend an hour or two to listen to the story, what's happened, what got you into this position in the first place. Um, and then say, right, this is what it means, these are all the people we need to connect you with um, and we'll stay supporting you right throughout the process to be able to get you to a, to a point of resolution. Now, I think we've had over 200 
150 taxpayers now that have been supported through this service. Um, we've got over 100 what we call guides, to speed assist guides. Um, that's an acronym DAG, D-A-G, which is quite quite humorous in the office. But um, that and 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 it's these sorts of services that have um, been sort of put up that will also complement and support existing services um, like the tax clinics. So we've gone from directly supporting taxpayers to now um, supporting those people, supporting taxpayers as well. So it is very difficult even for our own staff to know and navigate their way around the tax office and all the different areas and departments and rules and regulations and practice statements and these sorts of things. So the ability to have somebody internal who can help um, and be able to go to places like the tax clinics and get hold of people who they can then gain um, uh, assistance from and help um, is, is very important in doing this. The sorts of the sorts of things that we concentrated on, the sorts of circumstances we were concentrating on were mental health issues, um, family or domestic violence, breakups, sudden illness or disability within the family, sorts of things that, that meant that somebody's life sort of went on hold for a few years and as a result of that, the tax office didn't know and then started sending out assessments and then all of a sudden bills were due and payable and tax liabilities were due and payable and people just didn't know what to sort of do and how to, they didn't have the money to go and get help and, and all these sorts of things. So there's been a really good response, I think, from um, fr from the office in this sense um, and the existence, you know, of the tax clinics and these sorts of services is, is just going to be fantastic for taxpayers who find themselves in these sorts of circumstances and that need help in, um, in, in, in dealing with the... <coughs> um, the tax help service has been around for about 40 plus years now. Um, so um, the amount of tax in order to be eligible um, has gone up since 40 years ago. <laughs> I'm not sure what it started at, but it would have been a lot less than 60,000. So um, if, if your income is around 60,000 and, and you weren't a contract or running a business or a partnership, shares, etc., on on the board there, um, you can actually, during the July to October period, um, and there's a list on the website of all the places um, that you can go to um, around around Victoria and around Australia. Actually, help tax help in um, preparing and lodging your return. So if you've got um, what you think might just be one or two simple sort of issues, but you just can't find the information or you can't get onto someone in the office to help you or anything like that, there's there's these tax help um, there's a tax help service that can. Um, that can that can send you there, and again, all these things will interact. I think really, really well with the clinics and others that um, um, to be able to support taxpayers. Um, for those that um, have got internet access and um, are able to go onto the ATO's website, um, the the website has has gone under um, in the last um, four or five years significant improvements, and there's a lot of information. It's just a matter of knowing where to go. Um, it is worth spending a bit of time when you don't have a tax issue, just having a look at it, so that when you have got a tax issue, you've got you, you, you're sort of able to to remember and understand where where parts of the um, what what's on the website and, and what parts of the website might be able to help. It is split up into individuals and businesses um, and not for profits and and that. So so there is quite a bit of detail there. There is a virtual assistant called Alec. Um, and um, Alex is counterintuitive, so so the long the more questions that Alex gets, the greater the database is that Alex has for for questions that have previously sort of been um, lodged on the on the website. Um, <coughs> there is a business assistant program. I also look after the small business disputes um, in the ATO now as well, which um, has had a really big focus. Um, in the last couple of years about um, the importance of small business, the importance of the people they employ, the importance of the small business providing money for the families that run those small businesses. And um, there's um, more recently been um, the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman's Office has set up a tax lawyer concierge service and uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has now set up a small business division within that which will give you a 28-day Turn around, and if you're not represented in the ATOEs, you'll have your you'll be funded for representation. So, so there's a lot of government support now for small businesses, small businesses that get into disputes, to getting those disputes resolved really quickly, so people can get on with their lives. Taxpayers Charter came around in um, 1997, 
Um, the thing about this um, is probably this line here about um, the ATO has a presumption that taxpayers are being honest. Um, and um, there is the odd occasion when taxpayers um, aren't, but there is a presumption that taxpayers are. So, so one of the most important things in your dealing with is um, that there is an assumption that the taxpayers are honest in their dealings unless we find details um, to suggest otherwise. Um, and that the ATO will help you get things right. I think there's, there's often um, a, a lot of cynicism about the ATO and I think um, quite, quite rightly from people's experiences with the ATO being a big government um, bureaucracy, but um, the services that we're sort of talking about here that have been, that have been up and running now for a good four or five years, um, the feedback that we get from the people that use those services and also the people that will now be accessing the clinics um, is... is so positive because they're people who were vulnerable, they didn't know where to go, they didn't know how, uh, or what the issue was um, or have a good explanation of the issue and there's a lot of people out there now, there's a, um, there's a lot of services and support available now for people to be able to work and navigate their way through disputes. <coughs> um, one thing that people don't know, um, and Sean touched on, was that um, you can actually, if you're in a position where you're unable to pay your tax liability, you can actually ask um, our debt area, you can ask the commissioner to actually release you from, from debt. And that could be um, a partial release or a full release of the, of the payment um, based on certain circumstances. Now, it's not something that's just naturally given. Um, the tax office is administered with, with collecting the, the right amount of tax, but in circumstances where, um, and on the, on the slide there, there's examples of serious hardship. If the pain of the tax liability is then going to cause um, issues, being able to put food on the table, clothing, medical supplies, accommodation, education, those sorts of things, then um, you can actually apply to have your tax liability waived um, or released or partial, partial released. Um, there is also an ability to have um, your tax liability um, or any government liability waived um, by the Department of Finance. And that's a process um, that is not um, known about. Uh, taxpayers don't quite often use it. And we actually supported a taxpayer through the disputed service not that long ago. And I dare say there might even be some that come in the tax clinics. This is where all other avenues have been exhausted. And and actually on the form for the Department of Finance, it does actually have to, you have to detail all of those avenues that have been exhausted. And if those avenues, you can't exhaust it on the tax issues, the last port of call might be that you can ask for the department, for the, for the finance minister to waive um, the debt. Um, there's also active grace payments and those sorts of things for, for certain circumstances, but they're, they're sort of starting to broad um, beyond, um, beyond tax. Um, you can also um, request a payment plan. Um, and it, it, this is a bit sort of similar to um, nobody sort of understands that you can sort of walk into your bank after 12 months and ask for a review of your interest rate. It's a, it's a formal product that all the banks have. You can go in and ask for a review. Similarly here, with, with the tax, you can actually, if you can't um, make your payment now, but you, you can make your payment if you had an extra six months or if you had 12 months to pay, um, then you can also um, ask to be put into a payment plan. Um, and of course, it, 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 you have to come, I often say you have to come to the Court of Equity with clean hands. You, you have to get all your tax up to date and you have to have all your obligations and sort of up to date and be registered and on the system and all those sorts of things. And if you're in that position and there are circumstances in your life that mean that you're unable to make um, the payment of the debt, but you don't want to go bankrupt and you, you can actually pay, but you just need some extra time because there are things that are going on in your life, then certainly entering into payment plans. Um, quite often, if the tax debt's um, around that sort of $10,000 mark and you're looking for two years, those sorts of things can quite often very easily be put in place for you. We're, we're in the business of um, helping taxpayers in those circumstances to be able to, to make sure they can meet their obligations. The thing is, though, that whilst those payment plans are in place, all other tax obligations still need to be met. So returns still need to be lodged on time and um, whatever liabilities get raised need to be sort of included in the payment plans or, or paid when they're due and those sorts of things. So. 
All right. That's the end of the presentation. So. Thank you, Sean and Cameron. That was uh, very useful information. I'll open it up to the floor if there are any questions. Um, I'll just add to what uh, Cameron and Sean were saying before. One of the advantages of the tax clinic is that we have a direct contact with the tax office. We have a local liaison officer. So if you are finding that you're not getting anywhere in dealing with the tax office, one benefit of coming to the tax clinic is we have that direct connection as well. Um, so, yeah. Sure. I, I got behind in the tax returns and um, I had, one of the main reasons was I had an accountant that was an accountant shot through. And I didn't have any, I couldn't get any help from the tax office about that. Um, there's three uh, accounting associations and he wasn't registered with any of them so it wasn't any good there. And the police were no help either. So that was one of the reasons. Anyhow, I, um, I've, got a, I've, got, I've got an accountant at the moment but he's not giving me the truth. He's um, having medical problems and he says he's put in my tax returns and asked for an extension on um, a couple of others. But when I ring up the tax office, they know nothing about it. So. Yeah, that, it, it, it's a bit hard to, to talk about individual circumstances without knowing the actual, um, what, what's going on. Um, a lot of that a lot of that does not make sense, um, so you're right. Um, the, the office would know if, if returns have been lodged, so, so that, um, that that's something that probably needs to be looked at. Um, again, I'm quite happy to, to have a chat after the session, one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, there, um, the, there is the Tax Practitioners Board that sits within the ATO, and, and the Tax Practitioners Board um, is responsible for making sure that all of the agents are qualified, registered, um, so that taxpayers have confidence that they can go to tax agents and but tax agents are not immune to um, to the rest of society they often suffer um, mental health issues they often suffer facing financial issues facing bankruptcy and quite often um, their clients sort of then get sort of left behind and get left in a bit of a black hole and they're not quite sure what to do so in, in those circumstances certainly um, there are there are things that can be done, so I can have a chat to you about them. A lot of this detail will be on our on our website. Um, I dare say there are phone numbers that you can ring <laughs> um, to get on to people um, to, um, to to steer you in the right direction. Um, but at the very least, these are these are classic examples of I think what the clinics will be able to be able to support taxpayers to do. So yeah, often um, their clients sort of then get sort of left behind and get left in a bit of a black hole and they're not quite sure what to do. So in, in those circumstances, certainly right. um, there, are, there are things Where that can be done, so I'll go and have a chat to you about them. A lot of this detail... It's 747 Collins Street. Um, so it's down, um, you know, all the new buildings down close to um, Marble Stadium, the Docklands area. Uh, it, it has moved down to 747 Collins Street. Uh, we have offices in Mooney Ponds, Dandenong, and Box Hill as well. Right, um, so, yep. I couldn't find it on your website, but okay. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Any questions about anything we spoke about today, or anything? We are around, so... Yeah, otherwise, um, yeah, uh, the tax clinic will be seeing clients uh, August, September and October, and we'll be assisting individual clients and small businesses during that time. Um, and you're welcome to contact us before then if you need urgent assistance. Uh, we have set up a referral system as well to assist uh, taxpayers before the tax clinic is up and running in August. Um, so please join me in thanking Sean and Cameron for uh, the, I think, very useful information that they've provided to us this morning. Thank you.